scripture reading this morning before the lesson comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. True or false? You want to be liked by other people, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? And we're all virtually in the same boat regarding that. All of us want to be liked by other people, don't we? You don't just want to go around and make enemies with everybody you meet, do you? Surely not. Right? But now the, that's really not the question. The question is, to what extent will we go to be sure that everybody likes us? Should we just go along to get along? No. Should we? Should we do whatever we're asked to do without reservation or question? That is, somebody just tells us what to do, somebody we like, and then we just go do it just because they said it and we want them to like us and we want to like them? No. Should we set aside God's word to be more popular? No. We're going to be talking about fellowship for the next little bit. We may take a sidetrack next week. Maybe. Maybe not. But fellowship is a touchy subject. You know why that is? Because sometimes we just go along to get along. We want people to like us. So we'll fellowship anybody and everybody and ask no questions at all. Now, we don't teach our children that, do we? Did you teach your children that when they were growing up? You just go along with the crowd and whatever everybody else is doing, that's what you need to do. Well, you didn't teach your children that. I feel confident. But religiously speaking, we'll do that, won't we? We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want anybody to be upset with us, do we? So we'll extend fellowship to the people that God does not fellowship. You know the problem with fellowship? When you begin to talk about fellowship, ultimately, if you're not careful, it'll prove us to be an error. You know why that is? Because we'll be fellowshipping those we should not fellowship or refusing to fellowship those that we should be fellowshipping. Hence, the New Testament has to settle that matter once and for all time, does it not? So whatever the New, Te New Testament teaches about fellowship, that settles it. That's not almost it, that's it. Isn't it? So today we're going to talk about the foundation of fellowship. Three things that we're going to observe today, and here's the first one. In understanding the foundation of fellowship, it revolves around the first begotten. Now you say, where's that word in the Bible? Open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 1. 
The first begotten is Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn. When you look at Colossians 1, 15 and 18, and firstborn, first begotten, that does not imply that he's a created being. It means he's the preeminent one. He received the double portion, as it were, of all authority. So our foundation of fellowship is the first begotten, and the first begotten is Jesus. When you look at Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus' name is not specifically mentioned in this chapter. And in fact, his name is not mentioned specifically in the book of Hebrews until chapter 2 and verse 9, if I looked at it correctly. But there's no doubt that Jesus is the one primarily under consideration in Hebrews chapter 1. Look at Hebrews 1 and verse 6. And again, when he, that's the Father, bringeth in the first begotten. So that word is in the Bible, isn't it? And who's that in, with regard to? It's in regard to Jesus. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, the first thing in understanding the first begotten of the three things that we're going to talk about is the deity of Jesus. Jesus is divine. He is the first begotten, but he is indeed God. And Jesus is proven to be deity by the inspired writer of Hebrews through several means. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in fact, there are at least seven. But we're not going to delineate all those. We're going to focus on just one of those things. In understanding the foundation of fellowship, it is Jesus and Jesus is deity. Look at Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Actually, the end of verse 2. Hath in these last days, Hebrews 1, 2, spoken unto us by his Son, his Son is Jesus, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And here's what we're going to focus on. To prove the deity of Jesus. By whom also he, that's the Father, made the worlds. Now the Father made the worlds. But how did he make the worlds? He made them through Jesus. In other words, the Father originated the plan in his mind. But Jesus, the Word, as we'll discuss, is actually the one who executed the plan. And then the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead, as he is so called, who's revealed unto us everything that happened that we would not know otherwise. So Jesus is indeed deity. My Bible reads in Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the very first verse in the very first chapter of the very first book in the Bible lays out plainly that God created all things. Now, does anyone disbelieve that? Surely not here. Surely not in here. But then when we get to the book of John in the New Testament, John 1 beginning in verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now watch verse 3. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So that tells us what? That the word is God. He's not God the Father, but he is God the Word. Generally we know him as the Son of God. In John 1 and verse 14, And the word was made flesh. He became, as it were, a human being and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, why would we bring those things up? Because God created all things. The Word created all things. Therefore, what? The Word is God. The Word became flesh or was made flesh. And in the context of John chapter 1, it is undeniable that the word is Jesus of Nazareth. Therefore what? In the first century, people looked and saw a 30-something year old man. But this man had been God in eternity. And in fact, standing in front of them was God in the flesh. Therefore what? The foundation of our fellowship is on the first begotten. The first begotten is Jesus and Jesus is divine. But Staying in the context of Hebrews 1, Jesus is also our deliverer. Not only is he deity, he's also our deliverer. Now look in Hebrews 1 and verse 3. And again, there are seven reasons given in verses 2 and 3, but we're just going to look at one. Okay, with regard to Jesus, 
being our deliverer, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, now look carefully, when he, this is the Son of God, had by himself purged our sins. Meaning what? That Jesus is the one who has cleansed and purified us from the penalty due our personal transgressions of God's law. He's our deliverer. Now think about this. Think carefully. Jesus shed his blood for what purpose? Well, the Bible tells us in Matthew 26 and verse 28. Jesus there speaking metaphorically. For this is my blood of the New Testament. But his blood is literally which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So why did Jesus shed his blood? He shed his blood for the remission of sins. So that we could have our sins forgiven. Do you see that? So this tells us the type of deliverer that he is. He was not going to deliver us from any physical, I guess, affliction you could look at. But he's the, our deliverer from our spiritual affliction. And our spiritual affliction is sin. But think also in Revelation 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus, who is the faithful witness and the firstborn from of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now listen carefully to this. Unto him who hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. So Jesus' blood is that which has washed us from our sins, from our personal transgressions of God's law. So the question is, where do we meet the blood of Jesus? Ananias told Saul of Tarsus this in Acts twenty two sixteen, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Jesus died for all men, Hebrews 2, 9, but not all men have been delivered from their sins. Well, when are we actually delivered from our sins? The answer is when we're baptized into Christ. When we submit to scriptural baptism. Do you see what the foundation of our fellowship is? It's on the first begotten because he's divine and because he's our deliverer, but it also has to do with the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is not limited to the doctrine about Christ. That is, most people believe that Jesus is deity. Most people believe that Jesus is the deliverer. Most people believe that. But the doctrine of Christ is not limited to the doctrine about Christ. Yes, it includes that, but it's not limited to that. The doctrine of Christ is Christ's doctrine. That is, what Christ personally taught, the things that are written in red, as it were, in the New Testament, but also the things that he delivered to his apostles. Do you believe that there's a difference between the apostles' doctrine and the doctrine of Christ? Do you believe that there's a difference? I would like for you to come up and tell me that you do that because i got a bunch of questions to ask you. The number one thing is, okay, where did the apostles get their doctrine? Isn't that a fair question? If you don't think the doctrine of Christ is the same as the apostles' doctrine, fine. Then where did the apostles get their doctrine? You know, the Bible makes it clear. The Bible tells us specifically where the apostles got their doctrine. In John chapters 13, 14, 15, and actually include in chapter 17. That is Jesus' private ministry. And by and large, Jesus, the Son of God, is speaking to his apostles. So most of the things, and really when you look at it, all the things contained in those chapters are apostolic promises. In John 14, 26, this is an apostolic promise. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. See, you can't separate the Father from the Word, can you? They're, they're two distinct individuals. They work together in harmony. And then the Holy Spirit is told, or uh, the apostles are told, the Holy Spirit would be sent to them from the Father. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. 
Now, isn't that a promise? That's a pretty good promise, isn't it? Does that tell you what the doctrine of Christ is? It's the apostles' doctrine. John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, is that a promise? Yes. To whom were those promises made? The apostles. Hence, when we read in Acts 2, 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Where'd they get it? They got it from the Holy Spirit. Well, who sent the Holy Spirit? John 14, 26 says the Father, but John 15, 26 says Jesus. You can't separate the three members of the Godhead as far as their work because they work together. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And here's the first time in the New Testament, by my understanding, that we run across this word. And fellowship. And in breaking of bread. And in prayers. And if you can't understand all of that, surely you can't miss 1 Corinthians 14, 37. Surely you can't miss that. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you, what are they? are the commandments of the Lord. What is the foundation of our fellowship? It's the first begotten. Well, who is the first begotten? It's Jesus. Why is it Jesus? Because he is deity, because he is our deliverer, and because of his doctrine. And his doctrine is the apostles' doctrine. Now, number two. Let's get some facts concerning fellowship. First off, let's give the definition of fellowship. And understanding the definition of words solves and eliminates a lot of problems. And many times, you know why we don't know anything about fellowship? Because we don't even know what the word means. The only time generally we use fellowships with a meal. Where does the Bible use it like that? Just ask it. I'm not saying that it's sinful, but I'm saying if we're going to talk about that, where does the Bible even insinuate that? Right? Fellowship, according to Thayer's lexicon, he gives three separate definitions. Listen to all three. Number one, the share which one has with anything, as in participation. So it's a very broad word, but we'll see how it's used throughout the New Testament. Number two, it is contact, it is fellowship, it is intimacy. And number three, a benefaction jointly contributed, a collection, a contribution. What does all that mean? That means you can have fellowship in several different ways, one of which is by means of money. That the extension of money to someone to at least some degree is a way of partaking with them in fellowship. Now, Strong's Concordance says this. It is a partnership or participation. That's the main idea behind fellowship. Partnership or participation. This Greek word that's generally used, the same one that's used in Acts 2.42, when we first read about it in the New Testament, is used 19 other times in the New Testament. And believe me, it's not just translated as fellowship. That may be why we don't understand it any better. Because it's also translated, in addition to fellowship, as contribution, as communion, as distribution, as communication, and as communicate. But what's the main idea? Joint sharing or participation. That's key in understanding and moving forward. And clearly when you look in the New Testament, it has a religious meaning of common bonds. Do any of us in here today have some common bonds religiously? Do we? I certainly hope so. But now let's give some distinctions between fellowship and other concepts. Now remember what Jesus said in John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge how? Judge righteous judgment. All right? Now, here's distinction number one. There is a distinction between fellowship and brotherhood. There's a distinction between fellowship and brotherhood. Think of what the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. There's a four-point sermon. If I die next week, that'll preach. So you can preach 1 Peter 2, 17. 
But think of what the second one says. It says love the brotherhood. Here's one way I would like to illustrate this. Imagine in your mind, if you would, a funnel. You know what a funnel looks like? Or even if you don't know what a funnel is, imagine a triangle with the big end up here and the narrow end down here. But get in your mind the idea of a funnel. Brotherhood is broader than fellowship. Do you understand that idea? Brotherhood is broader than fellowship. Now, I know what you're thinking. He can't prove that. He don't know what he's talking about. He's up there just quoting a bunch of scripture. And they may probably don't even say that. Fine, look it up and see. But I want you to turn me to 1 Corinthians 5. And I'm going to prove this to you. That brotherhood is broader than fellowship. You know, when you look at the book of 1 Corinthians, these people were God's people. These people obeyed the Lord's gospel. They heard the truth, believed the truth, repented of sin, confessed Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, and were scripturally immersed in water for the remission of sins, and the Lord added them to his church. But there were still problems, big problems. In fact, when we look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 5, even members of the church, though we don't like to talk about it, though we don't like to admit it necessarily, even members of the church can have problems with fornication. Well, here, the church of Christ at Corinth was in the first century. They had a brother that was mixed up in fornication. And you know what they were doing? Oh, we love you, brother. We love you. You know why? Because we love the brotherhood. Well, that's fine. The Bible teaches to love the brotherhood. But you understand what it means to love somebody? If somebody's involved in sin, what's the loving thing to do? Is to say, whoa, time out. You're mixed up in sin. God doesn't fellowship that. Brotherhood is broader than fellowship. Apparently, the Lord's church at Corinth in the first century, they wanted to fellowship every brother. There's a problem with that. You know what the problem is? S-I-N. Sin is the problem. Now, for the sake of time, look at me in 1 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 9. In this same chat, or same book, rather, 1437, he said, I'm writing unto you the commandments of the Lord, all right? So don't, don't miss that. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, I, Paul the Apostle, wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. You've got to watch our close associations, period. Yet, verse 10, not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then ye must needs go out of the world. Now, we can't control everything, but we can control some things, can't we? There has to be a distinction. We cannot fellowship every brother. Why? Keep reading. But now, verse 11, I have written unto you not, this is negative, not to keep company if any man that is called a what? A brother. That means a member of the Lord's church. Brotherhood is broader than fellowship. We cannot fellowship every brother or sister for that matter. Why? Let's keep reading. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, even in the church, and this is exactly what was going on, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. That's not an exhaustive list, but a representative list. Do you get the idea? The idea is a brother living in intentional, willful sin. Look, with such an one know not to eat. That has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. And everything to do with a common meal. Somewhere along the line, we got to say this has to stop. You need to realize, brother, you're living in sin. Brotherhood is broader than fellowship. We cannot fellowship every brother. Why? Because of sin. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? That is, the non members of the church, the sinners. The lost, those involved in denominationalism. That's their business, what they do. But look, do not ye judge them that are within? What does that mean? That means members of the church. But them that are without, God judgeth. He'll work that out. Therefore, look at the command. Therefore, put away from among yourselves, members of the church, that wicked person. Brotherhood 
is broader than fellowship. Do you see that? There has to be a distinction in our minds. There are a lot of brothers who are unfortunately mixed up in sin. Can we fellowship them? Well, I'll tell you what John says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 John 1, 6 and 7. Do you know what he says there? If we say that we have fellowship with him, joint sharing, participation, and walk in darkness. Did you pay attention in Bible class? We lie and do not the truth. Oh, I'm in fellowship with God and I'm living in the sin of fornication. You're a liar. So says who? So says an inspired apostle. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Do you see a distinction? Because we've got to get some facts straight about fellowship. We cannot fellowship every brother. Brotherhood is broader than fellowship. But now let's talk about presence and participation. Let's get this ironed out while we're on it. Did y'all miss me? I know you did the apostles and other members of the church went into the temple. Do you understand that? They, their presence, they went into the temple in Acts 3.1 and in Acts 5.21. And in fact, when you look at Acts 5.20, an angel of the Lord told them to go into the temple. Now that's an interesting study. The phrase there, into the temple, means anywhere in the area. It does not mean the specific temple itself. That gets into Greek and we won't mess with that today. But why did they go? Well, we could speculate. Well, we know why they went into the temple. Well, tell me why, because the Bible doesn't. I can tell you what they did once they got there. And you know what they did once they got there? They preached the gospel. So their presence was in the temple. But did they participate with the things that went on in the temple? I can tell you what they did. I can show you where they preached the gospel. How about that? And in fact, made the Sadducees very, very angry. You know why? The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Read the book of Acts. Look at what the focal point of apostolic preaching was every time Jesus raised from the dead and they preached on it anyway. Despite the fact that they knew everybody was going to get mad at them, proverbially speaking, what did they do? They told the truth anyway, didn't they? So presence does not necessarily mean participation. Let me illustrate it practically speaking. Several weeks ago, I went... Because I'm a registered voter, or you, you ought to be. Because I'm a registered voter, I went and cast my vote. Do you know where I went to cast my vote? I went into a religious denomination. <gasps> Brock went into a denomination. Yes, I did. But why did I go? I did not go to participate in their foolishness. You know why I went? I went to cast my vote in the same manner as the apostles going into the temple. They didn't participate in their foolishness. They went there to preach the gospel. I can prove that. Well, why did Brock go to a religious denomination? I can tell you it wasn't to participate in their foolishness. It was to vote. Did you do the same? Shame on you if you didn't. But now understand this. We need to get some demonstrations of religious fellowship. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at negative, what it isn't, but then we're going to look at the positive, what it is. So let's look at the negative, what fellowship is not. Listen carefully. Eating a common meal together does not necessarily, I didn't say it never does, but I said it does not necessarily constitute religious fellowship. How do I know that? Because in Mark 2, 15 to 17, Jesus ate with sinners. And yet 1 Peter 2.22 says he never sinned. Therefore what? It's not necessarily sinful down across the table beside however it is with a sinner and eat food with him. Do you understand that? So that does not necessarily constitute religious fellowship. Is there any way possible that it could be fellowship? I'll leave the door open to say yes, there may be some ways that it could be. But by and large... To sit down across from a sinner or beside whatever it is and eat food together does not necessarily mean you're in religious fellowship with that person. So to say that it's wrong to have a fellowship meal, that's wrong. 
because it is okay. And if the sinners come back there and eat with us, we're not necessarily religiously fellowshipping those people for what that's worth. But now I want you to turn me to Acts 2. I'm running out of time. I just got started. And let's see what constitutes religious fellowship. And generally speaking, when you see the first time that the word is used in the New Testament, let's read what happened right there. Doesn't that make sense? And let's see what all they did moving forward from Acts 2.42 and look at the language of the Bible. And let's see if we do any of these things, okay? Okay. Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is the same as the doctrine of Christ, and fellowship, joint sharing, participation, communion as it were, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And let's read down. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And, verse 44, all that believed. That, the new name hadn't been given yet. The new name is Christian. It was prophesied by Isaiah, and it was fulfilled in Acts 11. But the new name for God's people hadn't been given yet. But at this time they were called believers. Meaning that they had done what they needed to do to please God. Which included Acts 2.38. And all that believed were together. Are we together? And had all things common. Do we have all things common? Why not? We better have because these people got it right. If we want our fellowship to be right, we need to see what they did. And so, whoa, sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Is that what we do? Stop lying. And they continuing daily. You might see me twice a week. Some of you even once. Right now is the only time you're going to see me all week. When you see the rest of everybody else here? What does this say? We've missed fellowship, haven't we? We've missed this one bad. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. That was a lawful expedient. Presence does not guarantee participation. And breaking bread from house to house. That's not the Lord's Supper but a common meal. How many people in here have you eaten in their house? Look around. These people got it. Look around. How many years have you been attending this congregation? Years, not months. How many years have you been? Whose home have you been in? Well, I'm preaching today. Y'all don't need to let me miss two weeks again. <laughs> Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. See what happens when fellowship is hitting on all cylinders? Conversions happen. You know why I'm, I, I'm convinced more conversions don't happen? Because they see us disunited. They see us bickering and fighting over the color of the walls, the color of the carpet, stupid things, petty things that don't amount to a hill of beans. But if this group right here, if we would get together on all cylinders like they were right here, look out. Look out because the Bible says praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily. Now they gathered together daily and what did the Lord bless them with? Daily conversions. Daily such as should be saved. Now number three. Faithfulness is required to maintain or to continue in fellowship. The first begotten, that's Jesus. We gave some facts. But now number three, faithfulness is required to maintain or continue in fellowship. I heard the man pray that led us in prayer this morning. I believe he said diligent in study, which is fine. But there's, there's application number one. In order for us to maintain fellowship, we have to be diligent in study. What does 2 Timothy 2.15 say? What does it say? It says study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Question. You know you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10, but here's the question. If Jesus looked you in your face and said, did you study to show yourself approved regarding religious fellowship, what would you say? Is that a Bible subject? Have you studied 
the aspect of religious fellowship to show yourself approved unto God, not me. You, have you studied diligently enough to say, yes, Lord, I studied it? Or are you just going to blame me? You're going to say, well, Brock didn't get up there and preach on it like he should have. Well, what should I have done? Come eat your cornflakes for you too? You didn't need me to do that, did you? So we all have to study on our own. Have you studied the aspect of fellowship the way that you should have? Or pick something else. Let's just say the Bible in general. Have you studied the Bible as diligently as you should have? Or have you been leaning on somebody else? Now that hits home, doesn't it? In order to maintain fellowship, we got to be faithful. And part of being faithful means remaining diligent in study. Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him in John 8, 31 and 32, If ye continue in my word, this ain't a one-time deal. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Do you know the truth about religious fellowship? Are we, are we refusing to fellowship those we ought to fellowship? Or are we fellowshiping those we ought to refuse from fellowship? Which one is it? Think about it. In order to know that question, we've got to open the book. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Do we understand what the will of the Lord is regarding fellowship? Do we? Because if we don't, then that means... You as an individual don't because we're the body of Christ. We're in this thing together. Are we not? Every part is vitally important. Just like in my literal body and in your literal body. When my little pinky toe hurts, hey, I know it. It's the same principle with us. We have to be together and have all things common. That means we got to be diligent and steady. But also, second, it means that we have to deny sin. Now, Ephesians 5.11 is clear, is it not? Now, let's see. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, I look around here and I see a whole lot more intelligent people than what I am. If I can understand that, I know you can. And have no, none, no fellowship, joint sharing, participation with the unfruitful works of darkness. What is that? Sin. But rather what? Reprove them. Do you remember? Brotherhood. Fellowship. Brotherhood. Fellowship. When a brother gets involved in sin and the sin is pointed out and he's made aware of what's going on, what do we do? The Bible answers that question. And Ephesians 5.11 is very plain. But do we have backbone enough to stick with it? Well, that's a different sermon. Ephesians 5.11 is clear, but only when we recognize light from dark. Jesus said something about that in John 3, beginning in verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You understand when we start talking about fellowship, it'll cut us everyone to pieces if we're not in harmony with what the Bible says. We can refuse it from those who are faithful and then extend it to those who are not faithful. Both are wrong. The truth lies in between two extremes, generally speaking. Now, we have to have the determination to accomplish both. That is, we have to be determined to be diligent and steady, and we have to be determined to deny sin. I think we've all heard Acts 2, 36 through 42 enough that I'm going to not quote that because I think you understand what it means. When you realize that you've done wrong, you make it right. And the way that we make it right is to allow God to wash away our sins. Now, when is he going to do that? He's going to do it when we contact Christ's blood. So the question is, how do I contact 
Christ's blood. And when I contact Christ's blood, I need to stay in that blood because salvation and the continual cleansing comes from abiding in Christ's blood, which is the same as abiding in his doctrine. If you're a sinner, you need to listen carefully because you need to hear the truth, Romans 10, 17. Once you hear it, you need to believe it, Acts 16, 31. Once you hear it and believe it, you need to repent of sin. Whatever is wrong, according to the Bible, Acts 17, 30. Once you hear it, once you believe it, once you repent of sin, you need to confess Jesus to be the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And you're still not forgiven because you've got to contact Christ's blood. You have to be immersed in water in order to receive the forgiveness or the remission of your sins, which comes only by contacting Christ's blood. Acts 2.38, you have to be immersed in water for the remission of sins. And brethren, this is to you. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. If we've extended fellowship to those who are not in fellowship with God, that's wrong. That's sin. We need to make that right. Repent of that sin and confess it to God now as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.